for those who are watching us karibuni sana this is one of the three days of national mourning that were declared by the president following this tragedy at the hillside and the russia academy children died so far 21 confirmed dead story that we are seeing uh, the headline the standard this morning is that we still have 46 who are unaccounted for what does that mean are they missing are they whatever is happening there there's basically pain and anguish for very many families who were parents and guardians in this school and we take a moment when we're doing this every hour to just say our condolences to the families to the school community at hillside in russia it's a sad one mm. we want to start our conversation this hour with uh, talking about corruption and the costs of corruption in this country when we talk about corruption you know we say it, uh, corruption it's it's become a buzzword okay and so we have invited Cyprian Yamwamu who is a spokesperson of the Kenya Bora Twitter Kayo movement to join us for this one Cyprian good morning good morning Eric uh city and the do um let me also <coughs> just uh, uh this morning express uh my deepest really uh condolences and uh, um to the parents and the families that have lost their loved ones especially the children that uh, uh they have lost there in uh, mm -hmm. hillside in russia uh this is uh the highlight of 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 national of national sadness and and failure really mm. when you look at it mm. because the, the the age of the children involved is very they are very young yeah uh, these are very 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 young children and they um i mean people are shedding tears uh, literally across the country yesterday in the morning uh we were just with the children and and we were just relieving imagining what this uh, looks like and uh, it is beyond what what words can uh, can 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 capture really the sadness indeed yeah indeed city yeah um why don't you give us the day's proverb you said this week we are in the final country the federal republic of somalia mm -hmm. okay yes a very interesting country with a very 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 rich history one does not tell a man, go away. One shows one what he must do. Mm. One does not tell a man, go away. Quenda. One shows the man what he must do. Uh, <laughs> that's what we call the writings on the wall. Mm. <laughs> if if, if, if captured in other words, uh, that the writings on the wall and... Uh, uh, it is uh, for you to to do what you need to do to to leave your time is up uh, you have not performed uh, what was expected of you you've uh, not worked as a diligent worker faithful worker and it's related to the corruption conversation we're having this morning instead of uh, being faithful and a steward uh, you have uh, you failed so I mean normally you are you are you are told what to do which is uh, a lot of the time what we say in Kenya, um, you know, do the right thing, which is uh, quit, leave. Um, so that's when you are told what to do. Mm. Uh, you are not told go, but you are told what to do. I, I mean, that's how I would, I would like to capture mm. it. Mm. <laughs> uh, you put it well. Mm. <laughs> that's an interesting interpretation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> A very interesting one. Corruption, Cyprian. I mean... Yeah. We, we talk about corruption all the mm. time. Mm. But recently what we have seen mm. um, is that people have started internalizing mm. what corruption is. Mm. And Ndu has said this very many times. Until the moment people start seeing, it's because of this that I am not able to get these services. It's because of corruption mm. that I'm not able to get these services. This is where the money that was supposed, that should have come to, for example, ensure that we have a good and properly working education system this is where the money went instead mm. of going into that system yeah. people have started now seeing in over and over increasingly this but there's still a lot of unexplained corruption mm. um it's especially 
let me let me capture it if you permit me this way that um the reason people are coming to the point where they can't uh, live with corruption is because corruption in the past did never never used to affect people directly let me explain the kenyatta years there was a lot of land to grab so people used to hear of stories out there of land is being grabbed and it's being taken by the big boys and people said fine i mean they have not taken my land anyway then came the moi years and moi started to strip assets from parastatos so every parastato including kenya commercial bank and others were being stripped you would be told go to that parastato go to that bank take a, a 20 million loan and you don't you don't have to pay and people used to hear of you know debts that were not being paid and so corruption was still a distant thing the healthcare system was working the education system we call them the the big eight the big eight were working then came kibaki revived the economy and introduced another form of corruption anglo leasing tanky projects uh, which were financed by EPNs, you know, irrevocable promissory uh, notes. And the people still were hearing about companies being registered in London and in other places, and the people paying themselves billions of shillings. And people said, well, this is, that's too much money, we can't relate with it. Because things were still working, and Kibaki brought back free primary education. There are two things if you supply in this country, people don't quarrel with you. Because education work is, is working, schools are opening and the children are learning, they are going to university and they are looking for their own ways of living and the healthcare system. People are going to the hospital and they are being treated. So the Kibaki year uh, corruption did not affect people in a way that they could be able to explain it to themselves. Then came the Uru Kenyatta years when things now started to collapse. The Uru Kenyatta years where he was with the current president, uh, Ruto, is that there was no land to steal, there were no parastatos to strip, there were no tanky projects to concoct and enrich yourself. So they actually created a new form of corruption, which is design fictitious projects, borrow money in that name, and don't do the projects. Basically, pay yourself, enrich yourself directly, so that Kenyans pay for you. And that is why currently, um, and, uh, and, and, and as you know, nearly every, out of every 100 shillings we collect, nearly eight, 80 shillings goes to paying for debt. What has happened? Now, you are only left with 20 shillings out of every 100 to finance education, health care, social protection, security, infrastructure, everything, you can't do that. And still, still. And still, still. So what has happened is that the services have collapsed. And what else? And that's the final thing that uh, Kenyans need to note. What else has happened is that the population now has risen to over 54 million people. And the tragedy of that is that 18 million adults are unemployed. 18 million adults are unemployed. During the more years, practically everybody was employed. You used to graduate from university and you are posted somewhere as a DO, as a, an agriculture officer, as something. There was no unemployment in levels that we are talking about now. So you are stealing the little of the 20 that has remained when, as, when services are not being provided, and the people are dying in hospitals. Schools are not getting capitation money. University students don't have school fees to pay. So that you are stealing when everybody is saying that you are the one who has actually stolen. And it's because of your stealing that I'm not going to university. That because of your stealing and you are looting that we are unable to pay salaries. That we are unable to provide health care in hospitals. And it is because of your stealing that there's no infrastructure that is being built. So that is what the variables over the 60 years that have made corruption uh, so 
completely unacceptable. And the other thing that is that technology has now made it possible for people to report from everywhere in Kenya. And the people are starting to actually relate that the road in their ward that has not been built is because somebody actually was paid money for a road they did not do. Why do it in the open, Cyprian? Because I would think it would be so foolhardy of one or two or three, ten people to do this in the open. Just going back to what you've said that, you know, here we are saying, uh, so we borrow money and set up a fictitious project yeah. and then later abandon it. It's in the open. If you're going to launch a road, launch a, what are we launching? Bridge? All kinds of things happening all over the place. In the plain sight of everybody, why do that? Why do it in the open um, just to steal the money? Don't you realize that uh, somebody will figure it out later? No, no, no. They, 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 because over the years, people have said, it's actually Mwai Kibaki who said it. Kenyans will demonstrate for a week, maybe two days, and they will go back home. But what the Gen Zs have shown us is that the demonstrations are not for a day. They are not even for a week. And so when Ruto came to uh, power in uh, September uh, 2022, he believed that what they did under Mwai Kibaki and under Uhuru was still going to work. What they have discovered in 2024 is that they crossed the red line many years ago. Mm. except that Kenyans had not found a way to uh, gun, la rally themselves around this uh, problem of corruption. And so you are going to see from June 25th, as we call it, the June 25th uh, uh, revolution, that it is now not acceptable that you can be able to steal people's money and go home. If you look at the number of uh, members of parliament who were attacked, whose homes were attacked, mm. Uh, whose family details were exposed, even if it's unethical. It tells you that Kenyans have already reached a place where they are sending a very clear message that we are going to come to parliament, we'll come to state house, we'll come to where the corruption people, the corrupt people are hiding. That is what has changed. And the people still believed under Ruto that Ruto is such a bully, he's such a dangerous guy, nobody's going to stand up to him. They actually believe that he's a superhuman. That's why me members of parliament used to tell us, well, what can we do? <laughs> we know. I mean, what can you stop Ruto? That's what they used to ask us. They used to ask us, you think that you can really stop Ruto from passing his finance bill if he wants? So they believed that he was superhuman. And now they have realized that even William Ruto is not superhuman. People are going to have to take personal responsibility and they will not blame William Ruto for it. Is the problem at leadership or is a problem a societal issue when you say corruption if you look at then um, the advent of devolution in 2013 and what we have seen in terms of you know corruption and widespread corruption and just mismanagement of funds in devolved units over 1500 members elected members of county assemblies are among the bigger def ben beneficiaries of corruption in counties Many of them are newly elected. Many of them are youth. And they go into office and they look at that opportunity. What is it? Is it a travel? Is it at some training somewhere? Where can we just get money? Is it some car grant? Where can we get money? If you look at their governors and the number of governors that have been in office that have been accused of corruption, or that just audit reports are raising issues on how money was spent. And then you look at the community and the society where they come from. You ask yourself, is this a leadership issue or is it a society issue? Is it that the expectation is because you have become MCA of our ward, the next thing we expect you to do is start building a house, my friend. If you don't build a house, what kind of... When we were here, <coughs> when the Mbakasi gas explosion happened, we summarized this very clearly. Again, I'm coming here uh, days after the, the tragedy of in, in the Russia. We summarized it that it is a governance failure problem. It is the quality of citizens that are driving this failed governance and that all of this comes down to leadership. 
Leadership is what determines the governance that happens in a society. Mm. But actually, it is the quality of citizenship that determines leadership, which then determines governance. So those three things exist together. In the, to answer your question directly, those three things are the problem and they are together. The question is, where do we start from? Always that's the question. In the, before, during that period, the Gen Zs are not happened. Mm. You've seen that when the Gen Zs have risen, the quality of citizenship has gone up and the demand on leadership has increased and the governance is starting to change. So it is the quality of citizenship that actually uh, the, the Morara Kebasos, the uh, Omtatas, uh, the Kenya Bora Twitakayos, the people who are going to court, who are challenging the governors, the quality of your citizens mm. is what determines the quality of leadership that you get or that is in place. And it also determines the kind of governance that they exercise when they are in office. So they are actually interconnected directly. And so our call always has been improve the quality of your citizenship because then you will determine your uh, destiny directly. Everybody who comes to office will know that it's not going to be a place where you are going to enrich yourself. Mm. That is the incentive that is lacking at the moment. So if we make it uh, very difficult and make corruption very expensive, like we are starting to make it mm. uh, now, um, what is, what's going to happen is that only those who are publicly spirited are going to seek office. And the money, wa the wash washers and the money launderers and the drug dealers and all these types will stay very far away from mm. leadership because the public is going to be on their case almost weekly. And that is how you change your country. That's what's happening right now. And I promised you this when, I, when we were here. Uh, during that period of the Mbakasi gas explosion. I told you, I am in the counties, mm. the, the country is changing, and you are going to see it. I actually promised you. You know, the change is incremental. So a, a lot of the times, if we were to pinpoint the point at which a certain dramatic change occurred, we focus on the change or the dramatic events. Mm. But we sometimes don't bear in mind where it is that it started. But even more interesting, we sometimes can actually tell where it will end, but it seems so far away. End here being, if we have never seen people who have been involved in stealing from state coffers being brought to book, it is understandable why anybody else who then follows us and is in a state job or is in a position of authority will steal because they don't see the consequence or they believe that they can always get away with it. Now, the protest that started in June had been coming, we just had not seen it taking the form that it took. And because there are no more demonstrations, there are those who argue that it has come to an end and actually it hasn't. If anything, I'd be more afraid because of the silence. Mm. That is what I'd be fearful and I'd be saying, okay, what on earth could be fermenting? Because something was tried out, they saw a response, they now know that this is how the state will respond. So if they were to protest, they will not do the same things they did again because they know the consequences of it. But the real question is, those whom we have elected into positions of political authority and those who are in charge of our lives and who are in government, have they understood that actually change is with us? Not that it's coming, it is actually here and it's resident. Do you think they understand it? I interact with a lot of them, uh, the people who are in office today. I interact with a lot of them. In the, what happened in June was unexpected. Mm. I, I already said that earlier. Uh, people believe that under William Ruto, you are not going to say mwe. <laughs> <coughs> It's, it, you will be crushed. Mm. <laughs> what they didn't know is that four things had changed, and those things that have changed is what caused the June uh, 25th you know, revolution as we yeah. saw it. Mm. I already discussed them. 
uh, we have discussed the demographic changes, the population that has uh, changed. Uh, Eric, when I was voting, uh, when I voted the first time in 1997, mm. young people below the age of 40% or 40 years who were casting the ballot that year, we were only 26%. The young people who are going to vote in 2027, below the age of 40, are going to be 68%. <laughs> so that time we used to be disregarded. Mm -hmm. The youth are inconsequential. Just speak to their parents mm -hmm. and we will sort out this politics. And that's what used to happen. 2027, it is the young people's election. They are the ones who are going to say who they want and who they do not want. That is the first thing that has changed very significantly. Technology has revolutionized this society. And that is something that you cannot be able you, to ignore. The third thing is that we have a democratic constitution which is being defied, being uh, uh, violated. But it's actually a constitutional uh, infrastructure which we did not have in our years when we were fighting against corruption and fighting for good governance. The constitution of Kenya is a massive enabler for citizens. And the young people kept quoting sections of the constitution yep. <laughs> during the, the mandamano. Mm. So the constitution is the third and very important tool and a shift which has uh, enabled society to be what it is. The final one is the economy. Uh, I already spoke about it, that the economy is not favorable now. Those days, people would go back home and pick coffee and leave. But now, uh, uh, CT, things have changed radically, radically. And the levels of poverty and inequality are actually staggering. And so uh, that's why Ndu was asking, why are they doing it so blatantly? Mm. It's because there's nothing else to steal quietly. <laughs> mm. I've told you the things that were being stolen that time was land, so, was the uh, parastatos. There were things that were out there. But right now, there's nothing else to steal. So you have to go back and uh, uh, basically auction JKIA, auction KPLC, auction Kenjen. Practically, because there's nothing else you are going to steal money from. So. That is the thing that has changed about the country. And, and it is why corruption is now so visible and so direct because the blackouts are happening we don't know whether we are going to the lord shedding uh, uh, uh you know circumstances that south africa is in and so on and so forth so things are going to actually get very bad over the coming months because of these corrupt practices and uh, it is how you are going to see more kenyans stepping out and saying no way it is enough is enough and it has to stop. Cyprian Nimuamu, who is a spokesperson for the Kenya Bora Chuitakayo movement, cost of unexplained corruption in Kenya. What's unexplained corruption? <clears throat> unexplained corruption is uh, something that uh, actually we can trace back to 1999 when uh, Professor Kibwana and uh, uh, Justice Smokin Wanjala, when they published a book called the anatomy of corruption. So it's a, about 350 pages, big, big book mm -hmm. on uh, the anatomy of corruption from the Center for Law, uh, Clarion. And uh, that anatomy of corruption uh, took us through many countries. In Uganda, what we saw relating to this unexplained corruption is where Museveni and uh, had sent the brother uh, out of the country to mm -hmm. register many companies. Uh, with their friends, and these companies came back to Uganda as strategic investors. Mm -hmm. So you see, when you do things like that, people are not clear how you are doing the corruption. It's not clear to them. Because you have said that parastatos and uh, all these things, there's, there's even a public-private partnership, very high-sounding uh, language. Mm. And in uh, political economy, we call it the financialization of the economy. So once you start doing things like that, it is not very easy to say it is minister so and so, it is permanent principal secretary so and so, it is President Ruto who is doing it. 
it is just now when people are starting to know where the money from the expressway, for example, goes to. Uh, for, for, for every 10 shillings, uh, who is uh, collecting uh, the money. So companies were registered out there. They uh, became strategic investors. They built infrastructure. And you are now starting to see language like, let us build roads and uh, let people pay for those roads. Um, then people are saying, privatize healthcare, privatize education, privatize agriculture. Then somebody comes, you have been seeing Bill Gates in this country. So people, they are saying, remove people from this Rift Valley place and let us now introduce monoculture through GMOs. So the, the thing about unexplained corruption is when public sector corruption is conducted through agents that people cannot be able to pin down government officials against. Mm. So somebody comes and says, Kenya Airways has failed. We cannot run it as a profitable company. So what happens? Then it is sold to a strategic investor, for example. Mm. And then you see that a public asset has gone. Minerals are happening in this country, and you don't know the corruption that is happening there. So it is how private actors are brought into the public sector corruption, which you cannot be able to pin on government officials of the day. Mm. Can't pin or you haven't taken the bother to actually find out how it actually works, or you don't have the means to find out how it exactly works. I'm saying this because in the, what you are discussing here is not new. Not new. No, because in the Moi era, with parastatals, African tours and hotels, I'll give you a, for an example, mm -hmm. had hotels all over the country. What you'd see happening is the hotel would run down or would be run down to the point where its net value was much reduced and then it would be sold off. For a song, as we used to say. That mm -hmm. was a very shrill song, but mm. it happened over and over and over again. How did we, for instance, get to a point where... A national insurance company which had a monopoly, how could that go belly up? Kenya National Insurance. How? I mean, I mean, they were guaranteed business, guaranteed. It went belly up. Poster. How did Poster, a monopoly, go bankrupt? A monopoly. There was nobody competing with them. How? So, in that era, we perhaps knew less. And as you say correctly, we were suffering. But the suffering wasn't this intense. Two, people were not that aware. Three, the mode of communication was not as robust as it is now. Mm. But we did see the consequences of technology coming in. Mm. Posta, for instance, lost big time when the handheld instruments came in. People abandoned landlines completely. Mm -hmm. We came back to selected landlines, every, but the business that they had and they had a monopoly of simply disappeared. Now, as for delivering letters and parcels, other players also came in. So that monopoly also went. Now, the issue of letters is a bit tricky. People very rarely post letters these days. Okay. Mm. So I am simply saying that if we were to look at what we have now, and this is where I sometimes fault our leaders. Kwani, don't they have imagination? Why are you duplicating things that we've seen in the <laughs> past? Okay. If you must steal, at least be clever about it so that it takes us a long time to figure this thing out. <laughs> Uh, seriously, so by the time we're figuring it out, 10 years have gone by, say, oh, this is what happened. But this one, it happens, and you know exactly what is happening. Our fear is if you speak about it, you will be followed. If you talk about it vigorously and even claim to have uh, evidence, you will be jailed. That is what we fear. Mm -hmm. Or you might disappear altogether. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, everything I've said is actually reminiscent of the Moi era, everything exactly. I've just said, exactly. and the era before that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so we, what is uh, shocking, and that's why Eric is, is calling it an explained corruption, is because the, of the way, for example, the euro bond was done. For example, I'm just giving an example. So to explain to a country, to a citizen, that corruption has happened with the way uh, this, you know, um, uh, borrowing has been done and been structured, is always very difficult. That's why it's unexplained. People cannot be able to understand how we are in this mess mm -hmm. with all the constitution and its institutions. It's because the way the institutions have been structured is that they have been pushed out of the economy so that you have, you have inserted private players. Private players, you've uh, uh, brought them to healthcare, 
like for example you remove nhif and you bring in uh, shif and you insert private for private companies in that space and so people are actually contributing to private players so that it is not like how parastatos used to be stripped before this time people are paying money to a citizen pay bill for example and we don't know who is collecting that money and where it is going to mm-hmm. so this is the kind of uh, i don't want to call it a modernization of 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 corruption mm-hmm. but it is how you've inserted private players in a way that it never used to happen under moy because these private players when you go to e citizen you realize that there is actually a private player there who is doing it for com- let me let me give the last example of kplc and i think it will be very clear kplc is a monopoly which collects money from everybody in this country you bring private players who are collecting the tokens at the back and then at the end of the year you say that we cannot be able to account for 88 billion shillings that the tokens people was a french a french company and another one was takish and another one i don't know which one and uh, we don't know where they were taking the money <laughs> how do you explain how you cannot be able to explain where the votes in the server went then we were told in court that you know people are sleeping they are not open uh, yet they, even this server is not even ours it's in germany it's in uh, france i think this one was from venezuela and, and so on and so forth once you insert private players even in america they are dealing with it how corruption is even going to elections is is a completely new way of how things are being done by inserting private uh, players so you are told take them to court deal with them and that is going to take you forever and the the public officials who actually facilitated them into the system are no longer even in power and so you are looking for private players when is actually the beneficiaries are the public officials who brought them into the system in the first place and it is so subtle yet it is more devastating than it has ever been and this is about a global agenda of uh, displacing governments and inserting uh, you know global private players who you cannot even account to how do you even tax google for example how do you tax this other company they are all over the place we are paying money to them they are facilitating government and us and then once they steal the money and run away with it you cannot be able to reach them but somebody at the back end has already taken his commission do you think that uh, i mean because right now the the way it looks is that Uh, folks who may have their hand in the cookie jar or as i like to say are well immersed in the cookie jar are not really afraid of consequences because we do not see a consistent and continuous uh, mechanism that deals with people who steal public funds they're not taken they're stolen um or they know they don't just disappear they're stolen so there's that where nobody's really afraid because we don't see any kind of precedent having been set that that is severe enough to um stop anybody from going there in the future at the same time i think that there's a disconnect between really the dangers of corruption or or or, or the lack that it causes we're not connecting between public funds that are stolen and then the ability for the citizen to live a livelihood that is at the very least dignified when we're talking about shelter when we're talking about education and health and things like that that we don't make the connection between this money that is stolen and the inability for you to 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 survive do you think that if we did make that connection then this fear that we hope that people who are in the public space would feel then would become a reality oh yes oh yes in fact that has been the missing link and uh, you have actually have put your finger on it uh, very directly and um, i can predict now with a certain level of uh, confidence that 2027 uh if we get there with this current government when i said that in uh, february eric was looking at me and wondering <laughs> what, are you, what are you talking about <laughs> <laughs> what are you talk- what are you saying that we if we get to 2027 with this government i think this government is going to run out of uh steam it's it's going to run out of steam because the level of vigilance from the public and the ability to connect what morara kebaso is doing out there is uh, started as a very innocent and a very 
mundane activity of going to visit projects and but now people are starting to connect it very directly mm-hmm. because for every of these projects that have not been done engineers have already issued certificates of completion mm-hmm. 60% completion 70% completion and people have cutted away 280 million 1.3 billion and all that kinds of money without any road being done mm. and so people are starting to say no 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 it is better during the moi days because people used to eat but do something they used to eat in the doing mm. these ones are looting and doing nothing about it but you see that that's where the problem is you see we we accepted Corruption, even in that statement that, you see, they were doing it even if they were eating. You mm. see, that is already wrong. That's why I'm going to 2027. <laughs> and I'm saying, what you are going to see in 27, and I can predict with the, a very high level of uh, confidence, is that anybody who has been associated with corruption and anybody who has unexplained money is going to be in trouble in 2027. Because people have started to connect, like they did in the Asian countries, that your living large is at my expense. <laughs> your corruption mm. is what has denied us school fees for our children. Yes. It is what has made hospitals not to have medication. It is the reason we sold land to take our mom to hospital in India. Mm. It is the reason we had to bribe to get our son to be employed. That connection is now being done. That it is because of your stealing. When you see people rejecting Arambes to churches, that is what is happening. People are starting to say, don't bring those public officials, those politicians to our churches because we know the money they are bringing, stolen money. This connection do is, being, uh, con- is being done. Now the connection is there and where we are moving in the right direction as a country. Do you think the level the level of poverty and unemployment is what has made it necessary that people do se- civic education for themselves even if government does not want uh, them to do that. Mm. And largely we are starting to see Kenyans saying these are not our leaders, these are our dealers. These are dealers, not leaders. They are not leading us, they are not providing service. That connection is how the country is going to be liberated, is going to be lifted out of the current mess, uh, you know, that we have been in for the last uh, six years. Unfortunately, it may lead to uh, public officials uh, having to uh, pay a very, very uh, Mm. heavy price. And I can tell you that it may not happen uh, next year, but we are going to see presidents going to jail. We are going to see members of the cabinet and, and members of parliament being jailed in this country Hmm. in this country very very soon when do you think we're going to get a critical mass because you're saying 2027 i'm actually asking do you really believe that by 2027 we'll have a critical mass of people who influence change and i'm saying that looking at what has happened what was happening two months ago and what's happening now two months ago politicians were literally hiding Mm -hmm. yesterday just look at their social media pages they were all in church they were speaking in church they're no longer even hiding in the pulpits and their congregation is the same um yes we have the likes of morara kebaso and others who are supporting him and boni mwangi who's uh, you know just doing all these audits in the counties and others who are emerging but are we actually raising a critical mass of people who are woke enough and active enough to influence change. I want to say very confidently uh, because I spend a lot of my time in the in the counties again that uh, the critical mass we are going to have it w- if we don't have it already. People needed structure and they needed to be connected. That's has been the missing link and it's now being provided. Let me say this with uh, a very very high level of confidence now. In the city actually attributed to that that uh, what we are seeing with those people going back to church is actually a lull before the storm. People are waiting for one trigger. I don't want to tell you what that trigger is going to be. It, the trigger may even be uh, Masengeli refusing to produce the abducted Kitengela 3. Mm. I don't know what the trigger is going to be. 
But if you are asking whether there's a critical mass in this country of people who cannot stand and look uh, at uh, a few individuals, you know, most people do not know that we are dealing with the uh, 1% of the population. Mm. The people who are stealing are actually 1% of the population. They are not all of us. They are just 1% of the population. The critical mass of Kenyans who want change and are saying no to corruption has shot up so dramatically, the next trigger will sweep people out of office and it will be written in books of history. I am so confident as I was in February when I was telling you that we are completely done with William Ruto. If you go to that clip in February, mm -hmm. I told you, we are Kenyans are completely done with William Ruto. We are only waiting for a trigger, and the trigger was the finance bill. But you say another trigger then will come. The trigger is, is there. It may even be government being unable to pay the next uh, 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 installment of uh, public debt payments to foreigners, and we default. Mm -hmm. In the day we default, it may be in October, it may be, I don't know, maybe November, maybe December, I don't know. Mm. Um, uh, uh, I cannot tell you when the, the next trigger is going to be and what it's going to be. But our trigger is on the way. It may be Mbadi, the new minister for treasury, uh, republishing his finance bill as he has promised. I don't know what the next trigger is. So let them enjoy their time now in charge. But the information is very clear. This is a lull before the storm. When Kenyans are going to rise next to reject the way governance is being done in this country, even this broad-based uh, government, which uh, Masita Rus calls a broad, fraud-based, call, she calls it fraud-based government, you will realize that they are actually made uh, with the legs of, of, of clay. Hmm. There's been calls, and this is the thing, that when we look at, you know, I mean, I shudder to think that some of the stories that make their way into the public eye in terms of what is missing. Um, I mean, we keep giving the example of things that are budgeted for that are not done, whether we look at education, whether we look at health, whether we look at infrastructure, things that should be happening, which is the business of the nation. It's the business of government to have those things done. And when we see the continuous lack of those things happening, and we can point to certain reasons why. Look at quality assurance, for example, and we use the story that's in the headlines today. When we look at quality assurance that should be guaranteed by a Ministry of Education, for example, obviously there are some um, gaps that were not filled. Somebody somewhere didn't do what they were supposed to do um, and ha have not been doing what they're supposed to do. So when we look forward and we say it's the lull before the storm, that people are just waiting for that thing that's going to happen, that will be the straw that breaks the camel's back, there's always the call for then who's going to take over. And that has been the center of conversation, even from the protests that we saw hmm. and the continuous protests that we see, that somebody is yearning for somebody who's going to come and fill that leadership deficit. Is there a need for such a thing at this time? There is need for that. And the conversations that uh, are happening in this country, I have uh, the privilege of uh, listening in to some of them. Mm. Uh, that, that question really was at the center of uh, the collapse of the revolution in June. And uh, I know of very organized uh, groups coming together, political parties, civil society organizations, peoples, social movements across the country, um, using uh, X spaces, but now starting to meet physically because we've realized that the face of only raising these issues on uh, 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 social media is, is, ne is necessary, but is not sufficient. Mm. Is important, but is not sufficient. So people have realized that they must engage. If you can take Nairobi alone and the number of assemblies that have been carried out over the last one month alone, the number of assemblies that have been conducted in estates. Mm. The last one was in Dandora. Uh, uh, my friend uh, Buka, I saw him at the Dandora uh, assembly before he was arrested and denied uh, to fly out of, uh, uh, out of the country. Uh, you are seeing a critical mass of mobilization to offer leadership so that there is no gap. And the coming together of all these Kenyans who are committed 
to ending the corruption, the wastage, the pillaging of the economy is critical because that's how you build confidence that there's an alternative to William Ruto and the uh, ODM and all this. Uh, I saw yesterday uh, Kalonzo Musioka was campaigning somewhere in Kiambu and people said, deal with your governor in Machakos first and then come. <laughs> <laughs> Go deal with that issue in your party and then come and tell us that you are serious. What that tells you is that Kenyans are coming together and the demarcation is like during the Moy days. You are either with the politicians or you are with Kenyans. That choice is now being forced. And the people are choosing. Babu Owino, who could believe that Babu would say anything that was not going to please uh, Raila Odinga? Mm. Even the Secretary General Sifuna, I don't know whether you have heard him here since uh, they formed the broad based government. He was here on yeah, Friday. Friday. I saw him. Mm. I don't know what he said about it. Say the same things that you're saying it, now. It's, it's everywhere because he now does not know how to annoy uh, his uh, party bosses and uh, how does he live with the public, which loves him a lot. So Kenyans are forcing everybody to take a decision where even the church, where are you? Are you with William Ruto and his politicians or you are with the people of Kenya? Make a choice today. In the, like the, during the days of Joshua, I think everybody in their families are saying, yeah, as a family, we are now taking a decision that we are not going to be with William Ruto and the politicians. We are going to stand with Kenya and the values of this country, which are in the Constitution. Mm -hmm. So, yes, the critical leadership is coalescing. The outreach to the public is happening, and I think people are prepared for when that trigger happens to provide a constitutionally supported route uh, to giving this country uh, a transitional government first before Kenyans can be able to have a, a full-fledged elections to, to install a government that is legitimate. Do you think corruption will be an issue in the next election? it will be a critical big issue in the next election. Because like ICC was the, uh, the issue that time which galvanized uh, certain ethnic communities, this election of 2022 was actually an alliance of the corrupt. Every corrupt individual joined Kenya Kwanzaa and they got elected. I don't know whether they got elected, but anyway, they are in power. <laughs> Corruption is going to be a decisive discussion. The other discussions that are going to be there is that public debt and the economy, employment and etc., the things that William Ruto campaigned on, taxes, the economy is going to be at the center of the next general election, mm. just as uh, taxes, I mean, uh, as corruption will be a very decisive uh, uh, agenda in the next general election. Always good having you here, Cyprian. Thank, Thank you, you for so joining much. us today. Yeah. We'll invite you again soon. Cyprian Yamuamu is the spokesperson of the Kenya Bora Shwitakaya movement. He's been our guest. We talked about corruption, the costs of unexplained corruption in Kenya, and whether we are seeing a critical mass of people who are now connecting corruption to their daily situation. Keep it here for more. This is the Situation Room, the only way to start your day.